Hello and welcome to this Federalist Society virtual event. My name is Jack Derwin and I'm Associate Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. Today, we're excited to host a Courthouse Steps decision discussion on Biden v. Texas, featuring Professor Ilya Soman. Ilya Soman is Professor of Law at George Mason University's Antonin Scalia Law School, where his work focuses on constitutional law, property law, democratic theory, federalism, and migration rights. You can visit fedsoc.org to view his full bio. After Professor Soman's presentation, we'll go to audience Q&A. So please enter any questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window. Finally, I'll note that as always, all expressions of opinion on today's program are those of the guest speaker joining us. With that, Professor Soman, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you. And uh, as Jack mentioned, I'm here to talk about Biden versus Texas, which I think is better known as the Remain in Mexico decision from yesterday. In a normal Supreme Court term, this might well be regarded as one of the more significant cases. In this term, it may be kind of getting lost among the crowd of other cases that address more hot button types of issues like abortion, guns, religion, and so on. Nonetheless, it is at least a fairly significant decision. And I'm gonna talk about its significance both in terms of the specific policy effects and in terms of broader impacts on presidential power over immigration. Uh, so uh, just briefly to explain what this case is about, it is about the so-called migrant protection protocol adopted by the Trump administration in 2019, uh, which forced uh, large numbers of non-Mexican immigrants or migrants arriving in the U.S. across the southern border uh, to stay in Mexico to have their asylum uh, and also their removal cases heard, as opposed to the previous procedure where most of them would remain in the United States to do this. Uh, as a result of being forced to stay in Mexico, they often ended up there for many months or even longer because the adjudication of these cases is extremely slow. Meanwhile, they were exposed to a great deal of violence and coercion. Uh, human rights groups estimate that some 1,500 cases or more occurred over the period that uh, the program was in operation, uh, cases of uh, violence, rape, uh, assault, and, uh, and so on. Uh, so when Biden came into power in January of 2021, he had previously promised to do away with the uh, remain in Mexico policy. In June of 2021, uh, his uh, Department of Homeland Security, in fact, did so. However, uh, a district court uh, in response to lawsuits by conservative states uh, struck it down uh, on the theory that they hadn't given sufficient reasons as required uh, under the Administrative Procedure Act. Uh, the litigation continued in the appellate court. Meanwhile, uh, in October of 2021, the Biden administration, having previously withdrawn their June 2021 memo repealing the policy, they put forward a more extensive memo with more detailed analysis of various justifications and reasons. Uh, and this is the one that ultimately ended up uh, before the Supreme Court. Uh, so I'm going to start first start talking about the specific statutory issues raised by this case under the Immigration and Nationality Act. Then I'll talk about the Administrative Procedure Act issue. Uh, and I'll talk about finally the broader implications here for presidential power. Uh, and I'll also talk about a little bit about the practical effect of the decision. Uh, at the risk of ruining the suspense, I will note that by a 5-4 decision, uh, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the Biden administration here. Uh, and this is maybe a 6-3 decision if you count just where the justices stood on the merits, because Justice Barrett uh, said that she would have uh, preferred not to take the case on procedural grounds, but having uh, considered the marriage, she would have voted uh, with the majority if she had thought it was appropriate to do so. So Biden probably will be able to put an end to uh, the remain in Mexico policy, though, as I'll discuss a little bit later, there is one additional issue that still needs to be uh, litigated below. Uh, so uh, the statutory question here is under the section uh, 1225 of the Immigration and Nationality Act. And on the one hand, there's a provision which says in case of an alien who is arriving on land, including, of course, the Mexican border uh, from territory contiguous to the United States, the attorney general may return the alien to that territory pending relevant proceedings. Uh, and notice the word may here, this suggests that the attorney general doesn't have to return the alien. He can uh, if he wants to, but he doesn't have to. 
Uh, on the other hand, Section 1225 also has a provision which says an alien seeking admission, uh, if they're not clearly and beyond the doubt entitled to be admitted, the alien has to be detained for a, uh, for a proceeding under Section 1229 uh, of the same act. This seems to suggest that at least in many cases, detention is mandatory. Uh, and uh, the plaintiffs suing in this case, conservative states led by Texas and Missouri, they say that if the alien cannot be detained uh, or the, the administration chooses not to detain him, uh, then, uh, then it becomes mandatory for them to expel the person outside the United States to Mexico or perhaps uh, to some other country. Uh, the majority uh, opinion uh, of the Supreme Court authored by uh, Chief Justice Roberts and joined by two conservative justices and all three liberal ones, and also on this point, Barrett also agreed. Uh, they essentially say that even if the mandatory detention provision is, is violated, it doesn't follow that the only remedy for this violation or the required remedy is to expel the person. Uh, that uh, the mandatory detention doesn't convert the may in the previous section uh, of, uh, uh, of the INA into a must. Uh, and they also point out, and I think the dissent recognizes this as well, uh, that it has never actually been possible to fully comply uh, with the mandatory detention provision because there's way more migrants uh, than the US government has detention facilities for. This has always been true. It was true under Trump, it's true under Biden, it's true under every president who has served since this provision was first enacted uh, now more than 25 years ago. Uh, in addition, the majority uh, points to section 1182 of the same act which creates the option of a parole into the United States in a quote, case by case basis uh, for people who would otherwise be inadmissible and what the Biden administration has essentially done for many of the people who might otherwise be detained is parole them under section 1182. Uh, the dissent by Justice Alito does not deny uh, that there is this option of parole. They just say that case by case means that there has to be very detailed case by case adjudication uh, and that the Biden administration has violated this because when they let in 27,000 people and only very modest uh, inquiry into each individual, then that wasn't really case by case. To my mind, the majority has the better argument on this particular point because unless case-by-case -case adjudication is going to be completely arbitrary, uh, then it has to be guided by some sort of rules. Uh, and how much investigation you do into each case to determine whether the rules have been followed, uh, I think is up to executive discretion unless the uh, law says otherwise, which it does not. Uh, and realistically, uh, I'm not sure there is a fundamental difference between case-by-case -case decision making and general rule-based decision making, unless you're willing to say the case-by-case -case administrative decision making has to be extremely detailed, or alternatively, if you're willing to say it has to be completely arbitrary. Otherwise, I think so long as there's some minimal effort to ensure that the particular individuals fit under the rules that have been set down, uh, I think that is sufficient. I also think the majority is right on this question of uh, the trade-off between the mandatory detention and the may uh, send the person back abroad. Uh, even if the mandatory detention provision has been violated, which it is all the time by every administration, it doesn't follow uh, that the may and the other provision of section 1225 uh, becomes a must. Uh, in effect, uh, what Congress has done with the mandatory detention provision is that they've set down a rule which is not possible to obey because there's not the resources uh, to obey it and never has been. And even Justice Alito in his dissent, he admits that Congress can't compel the executive or at least courts can't compel the executive uh, to do the impossible. Uh, uh, I would add that you know, if this provision said, well, the executive must send the 
people to the moon while they uh, wait. Uh, and it turns out that it's impossible to send them to the moon. It doesn't follow, therefore, that the only other option uh, or that the remedy for that is to deport them to Mexico. Uh, that, you know, essentially Congress has made here a command that is impossible, uh, but the remedy is not to change the wording of this other provision uh, of the statute. Uh, so uh, that's the statutory issues here. I would add merely that in another part of the majority opinion, Chief Justice Roberts says that it's particularly important not to make this mandatory expulsion because mandatory expulsion to Mexico, forcing people to wait there, that requires the cooperation of the Mexican government. Uh, and if Mexico doesn't want to cooperate, which sometimes it does not, that creates problems of foreign relations. He says that the executive should get special discretion with respect to foreign relations. I have some sympathy with this, but I also think that Congress has the power to override discretion in this particular area. Uh, so if Congress really did make a clear command that the people, that the only other option is to expel people, then uh, you know that I think would override that, but I think that is not uh, what has occurred uh, here. Uh, so uh, in addition to the issues under the Immigration and Nationality Act, there are also issues under the Administrative Procedure Act uh, where uh, the Fifth Circuit uh, and the lower court had said that the original June 1st memo issued by uh, the Department of Homeland Security didn't analyze the issues thoroughly enough. This is actually in some ways similar to a Supreme Court's decision a couple years ago, where they ruled against the Trump administration's efforts to end the DACA program, saying they hadn't sufficiently considered the issue. Uh, but uh, in that case, as in this one, the administration tried to fix the problem by adding some more analysis later. Uh, um, in the uh, DACA case, the Supreme Court said that the later analysis was not itself a final agency action that displaced the previous one, it was just a post hoc rationalization. Here, by contrast, the Biden administration actually had uh, essentially canned the June 1st memo, which was considered inadequate, they started all over again from square one and produced a whole new memo, which does examine things in greater detail. Uh, and therefore, uh, Roberts, who of course also wrote the DACA opinion here, he says this is a different case. Yeah, this is a whole new uh, agency action, not just an attempt to rationalize uh, the previous one. Uh, he also rules, I don't have time to go into this in detail, but he also rules that in this case, Unlike in the census case uh, in 2019, where the court ruled against the Trump administration's efforts to uh, analyze uh, or to ask questions about legal status in the census, here uh, there wasn't uh, sort of dishonesty about the uh, real rationale for the action and that uh, you know, makes things different. There wasn't bad faith. Uh, however, uh, there is one issue under the Administrative Procedure Act which remains unresolved uh, because it wasn't reviewed by the court, and that is the question of whether uh, the Biden administration's actions in ending remain in Mexico were, quote, arbitrary, capricious, or an abuse of discretion, uh, and uh, that's remanaged the lower court. I think under this opinion, it's somewhat unlikely that the plaintiff states could win under this because uh, if there's not bad faith, if the uh, October memo is thorough, then that should be enough to not be uh, arbitrary or capricious. But uh, the Supreme Court did leave this issue unresolved, so we don't yet know what's going to happen on the lower court. There's a final issue, which is procedural in nature, uh, and uh, which Justice Barrett based her dissent on. Uh, she was also joined by three other dissenters on this point, but the three others uh, also disagreed in the majority and other things. And that is that under section 1252 uh, of the INA, there's a provision which says no court under than the Supreme Court shall have jurisdiction or authority to enjoin or restrain the operation of various provisions of the INA, except as applied to an individual alien against whom proceedings have been initiated. Uh, the lower court had issued an injunction uh, against the Biden administration's termination uh, of the Remain in Mexico policy. And if Section 1252 applies, uh, says Justice Barrett, 
That means that the lower court had no power to issue that injunction, and the Supreme Court should have just dismissed the case on that basis uh, and not reviewed on the merits the question of whether the Biden administration had the authority to do this. Uh, and uh, all, uh, uh, and while Chief Barrett thinks that they did actually have the authority to do it, whereas the other three dissenters thinks that they did not, all four of them agree that this issue should not even have been reached, uh, that uh, the lower court's uh, ruling should have just been overturned on the basis that uh, there was just no authority to uh, do an injunction here. Uh, and notice that under this approach, it seems like uh, the Biden administration would still be able to go forward with the termination of uh, the Remain in Mexico program, or at least no federal court could stop them. Uh, so on that point, it seems like in terms of practical implications, there may not be as much of a gap between the dissenters and the majority as they're seeing to the dissenters. While three of the dissenters do think that what the Biden administration did was illegal, they also think that a lower court can't issue an injunction against it. Maybe the Supreme Court can issue an injunction, uh, and that is what Chief Justice Roberts argued. The Supreme Court has jurisdiction over these issues, but uh, Barrett suggests that if the lower court could issue, cannot issue an injunction, then the Supreme, then the lower court can't even hear the case. And if the lower court can't even hear the case, then it can't get to the Supreme Court. I think this is actually a key weakness in Barrett's argument. It seems kind of silly to say that the Supreme Court has the power to issue injunctions, uh, but the case can never even get to the Supreme Court. That seems uh, contradictory. Now, to be sure, if an injunction can't be issued, there theoretically could be other remedies that a lower court could put in here, but it's not easy to see exactly what they would be. Uh, I presume this conservative Supreme Court would not allow money damages in this sort of a case. Maybe you could have a declaratory judgment. Uh, that is, a district court could say, this is illegal, but we're not issuing any injunction or order uh, to change things in any way. And I guess you could say, an honest administration would obey the declaratory judgment, even if they didn't really have to. But it's easy to imagine them saying, well, this is just a declaratory judgment, doesn't require us to actually do anything, and therefore we're going to keep on doing uh, what we're doing. I think that's certainly what Donald Trump would do if he were faced with a situation like this, and uh, maybe Biden uh, would do the same. So uh, while the majority and the, and the dissenters disagree on some things pretty vehemently, it seems like if you accept uh, the dissent's procedural stance, then ironically, uh, the court still couldn't do anything about this, even if the Biden administration uh, had acted illegally, which I think is kind of strange, but uh, that's what it seems like to me. I should emphasize, however, that I'm not a remedies expert, and this analysis is based on my reading of the decision as of late last night, so it's possible that I'm missing some remedies-related point. If so, there may be members of the audience who know more about remedies than I do, uh, and I welcome uh, their correction. I really do. I have to acknowledge the limits of my expertise here. So what are the implications of this? The immediate policy implications, I think, are fairly clear. Uh, that is that now uh, Biden can succeed in terminating this program, most likely. And so there will no longer be thousands of people who are subject to it. At its peak, there were some 70,000 people detained under Remain in Mexico, in Mexico. And as I said before, they were subject in some cases to horrific violence and assault. So to me, that's a good thing that that won't happen anymore. By the time the Biden administration wound down the program, there were only about 13,000 people in it. But if they were forced to restart it, uh, it would be the case that probably that number could grow massively. Uh, but it is also the case uh, that uh, Biden or a future president under this reasoning uh, could restart the program at almost any time he or she wanted. So a future Republican president could certainly restart it. And there's a good chance they would if they win the 2024 election. Uh, or Biden himself could restart it uh, if he chose, if he thought it was politically advantageous for him to do so. Uh, and he has, in some cases, continued or even started harsh immigration policies of various kinds uh, when he has thought it uh, beneficial uh, for himself. Uh, there is, as I mentioned before, still the possibility 
that Biden's action could be invalidated by a district judge based on Section 706 of the Administrative Procedure Act. They don't think that would be the correct decision. And it seems like the court has cautioned against that, but it's not precluded. So there will be more litigation uh, over this. What are some of the broader implications of this beyond this particular policy? One is, I think, this continues uh, the Roberts Court uh, pattern of being in favor of very broad presidential discretion in immigration policy. Uh, they did that in the travel ban decision. Uh, they did that in uh, the habeas corpus decision uh, two years ago. The one exception was the uh, the region's decision relating to DACA, uh, but uh, there it seems like that was just an exception because of exceptionally poor administrative law work by the Biden administration, I'm sorry, by the Trump administration, uh, as I can discuss in questions if people are interested, I think the, the Supreme Court made clear that with somewhat better lawyering, uh, either Trump or a future administration could put an end to DACA uh, if they really wanted to. Uh, uh, I do think this very deferential stance to executive discretion is at odds with some of the other doctrines uh, that the court has been pushing, including the non-delegation doctrine, which limits delegation to the executive here. If you combine this decision uh, with the uh, travel ban decision, it seems like the president has not quite unlimited, but almost unlimited discretion uh, to uh, prevent the entry of almost any migrant who isn't already a citizen or permanent resident. Uh, and if they don't fully prevent it, they have near total discretion, at least with people crossing on land, to determine whether those people uh, should be whether uh, sh should be allowed to have their cases considered in the U.S. or whether they should have to wait in Mexico or somewhere else. If they're in the U.S. on top of that, the executive has near total discretion to determine whether they should get parole or not, or whether they should be put in detention, though the putting in detention option is constrained by you know, the reality that there's only a limited number of detention facilities. So there's very little here that the executive cannot do when it comes to migrants. And if you are concerned about non-delegation principles, then this should bother you. It certainly bothers me uh, because I do believe that non-delegation uh, is a significant issue. Finally, uh, there is the ongoing litigation in the lower courts going on right now over whether the Biden administration can terminate the so-called Title 42 expulsions begun by Trump and continued by Biden using the CDC's public health authority. Uh, and I think tentatively at least that this decision bodes well for the resolution of the case uh, about whether Biden can terminate this if he wants to. A lower court or a district court has enjoined this as a violation of the Administrative Procedure Act. I think there is a good chance that if this reaches a higher court after this decision, that Biden will be able to terminate Title 42. Elsewhere, I have argued that uh, Trump and Biden actually acted illegally when they did the Title 42 explosions in the first place because either the relevant statute doesn't authorize it or it's a violation of non-delegation and also the major questions doctrine. We can talk about that in the questions. I also have an article in the NYU Journal of Law and Liberty, which goes over this in much greater detail. Uh, but I think uh, if you put together the Roberts course jurisprudence and immigration with rare exceptions, uh, the impact of that, uh, of that uh, um, jurisprudence is that the president can do almost anything he wants. However, uh, I will note that uh, there could be some limitations based on non-delegation and major questions. Uh, this court and uh, really almost any court has not seriously considered what the implications of those doctrines for immigration are. There has been some lower court discussion of this, uh, including a partial invalidation of one of uh, Trump's COVID era visa limitation policies, but uh, the Supreme Court has not opined on it. Uh, so uh, this, in one sense, this decision is a victory for people who want uh, you know, more favorable and less cruel treatment of immigrants, but it's also a victory for people who like broad presidential power uh, over immigration. Uh, and on that note, I will conclude, but I very much look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Professor Zoman. And as you mentioned, now we'll turn to audience Q&A. Again, to our audience, if you'd like to submit a question, please just use the Q&A box at the bottom right of your Zoom window. 
And we do have a couple in here already, so I can kick us off with one. Historically, a new pres presidential administration has had broad discretion to re reverse a prior administration's policies, so long as they explain why. That seemed to change in the Trump administration, where the court seemed to be eager to take a hard look at policy reversals. Were cases like DACA an outlier, or is this case an outlier in a trend towards heavier scrutiny of policy reversals? So uh, I think, as I mentioned before, that in the DACA case, uh, the Trump administration got into trouble because they did just a really terrible job of Administrative Procedure Act wiring, which I think arose in large part because for political reasons, they didn't want to admit that they just didn't like DACA and wanted to get rid of it for policy reasons, because that would have meant openly saying, you know, I think a whole bunch of people who were brought into the United States as children should be deported, even though they, the children, didn't do anything wrong. So instead, they put forward uh, some badly flawed rationales of various kinds that were both pretextual and didn't consider some of the key issues that had to be considered. Uh, and if you read Chief Justice Roberts' opinion in that case, he makes that clear. But he also, in effect, outlines a roadmap by which administration could get rid of DACA if they wanted to, which is they could, in fact, just come out and say, we think DACA is a bad policy. And they could consider the issue of the impact on the people who come in as children. And they can, in effect, say, well, you know, this is not my view. I think it would be terrible to deport those people. But they, not me, could say that, uh, you know, we think, well, it might be unfortunate for those people to deport them. It would be in the interest of deterring future illegal immigration and maybe some other kinds of interests. Uh, and therefore, you know, that's why we're doing it. Um, uh, and of course, the Trump administration did, in fact, manage to put in a wide range of new policies, uh, new and much harsher policies with respect to a huge range of immigration issues where courts, uh, including the Supreme Court, often upheld them. I noted the travel ban case before. Uh, there was also this very policy, the Migrant Protection Protocol, also the Title 42 expulsions. Uh, if you include all the Trump administration's policies, uh, they actually made the United States more close to immigration than at any time ever in its history throughout the previous 200 years. So while the Trump administration did suffer some defeats in court, it can't really be said that uh, the courts turn out to be uh, you know, a really big obstacle to their doing what they wanted to do. The courts may be stopped like uh, some of the most dubious five or 10% of what uh, the Trump administration wanted to do in immigration policy. And even that part uh, in the DACA case, they outlined what's in effect the kind of roadmap that uh, could be used to affect the change if the administration wanted to. So you did note that you are, are not a remedies expert, but we have a question here regarding remedies, if you're willing to take a stab. I'm curious about the, the legal remedies regarding international sovereignty, international terrorist threats, and threats to U.S. national security that might be unique to this case, given the, the actual context. So the executive certainly has the power to detain and prosecute people where there's evidence that they're engaged in uh, in. Uh, not only terrorism, but other kinds of criminal activity. However, uh, here as elsewhere, there is a wide range of discretion that the executive has. Uh, so even in the case of a terrorist in prison, the executive say, well, this is not an important enough terrorist. I don't want to prosecute him for whatever reason, or you know, this person is a US intelligence asset or something, I don't want to prosecute him. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of separate statutes which deal specifically with terrorism prosecutions. Uh, so uh, the bottom line in this case uh, is, uh, at least from the majority's perspective, but to a considerable degree, even from a dissent's perspective, is that the executive has a very wide range of discretion. I personally think giving them this range of discretion uh, is a problem under the major questions doctrine and under the non-delegation doctrine, but neither of those things even show up in this case uh, um, because the, uh, the plaintiffs didn't argue it. And I think one reason why they didn't argue it is because uh, these are conservative red states. They want there to be broad presidential discretion to expel migrants or keep them out. Uh, so they want to limit uh, presidential discretion in some way to do things they don't like, like ending uh, the MPP program, but they don't want to do it in a way like with non-delegation, which would also constrain presidents they do like. And obviously uh, that kind of have our cake and eat it issue is a problem on both left and right that, you know, where, where possible, they try to do litigation postures where, you know, you constrain the president you don't like, but you empower the one that you do. 
I think we have time for one more question here. If a lower court issues some remedy, say a declaratory judgment in the state's favor, the states and the states win, what is there to appeal? And why would the federal government ever appeal if only the Supreme Court can issue an injunction? What's the pra practical remedy under the INA if there is one? So these problems would arise if Justice Barrett's position had been adopted, uh, but uh, her, her position was not uh, adopted. Uh, um, uh, if the uh, lower court, if, if, if the lower court uh, issues a remedy uh, other than an injunction, because under Justice Barrett's position, it would seem like this issue could never be truly litigated uh, because the lower court would not even have the, the power to, uh, to take the case. Uh, um, but under the majority's approach, the lower court can take the case. They're just limited in their remedies. Uh, obviously, if the federal government lost the case and a remedy was issued. The federal government has the option of trying of not trying to appeal because they might say, you know, the loss is not that bad, and we might get a worse loss if we get to the Supreme Court. Uh, but uh, you know, that the federal government always has that discretion about whether they want to appeal a case that they uh, lost or not. Uh, as I said before, I do think it's kind of paradoxical that under the position that the dissent has, it seems like. Uh, their position is that what the Biden administration did was illegal, but also that there may not be any kind of remedy uh, that uh, any level of court can issue against it. Or at least any kind of remedy likely to be effective, unless they're willing to say that money damages are available. I think that these conservative Supreme Court justices are very unlikely to say that there could be money damage in a case like this. But what do I know? Maybe they, they would think of some way uh, that it could be possible. Well, thank you so much, Professor. I think we'll, we'll wrap up there. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you to our audience for tuning in to today's virtual event. You can check out our website, fedsoc.org, or follow us on all the major social media platforms at FedSoc to stay up to date. Our next Courthouse Steps Decision webinar will be on Oklahoma v. Castro Huerta at 1 p.m. Eastern next Tuesday, July 5th. With that, we are adjourned.